New Year's greetings from Brussels, the capital of Europe. As you can see here, the city that is sometimes falsely described as boring celebrated the new year with joy. Welcome to all of you to the first edition of State of the Union in 2018. I'm Stefan Grobe. In almost all of the New Year's speeches by European leaders, there was one recurring resolution, and that was reform. Reforming the European Union, its institutions and policy is apparently very high on the official agenda. Needless to say, leaders have very different opinions on what reform should look like. Some of them lost no time talking about their next moves. In Vienna, right after attending the Philharmonic's traditional New Year's concert, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte met with Austria's newly inaugurated Chancellor Sebastian Kurz. Both are occasional critics when it comes to European affairs, but are considered friendly EU stakeholders. They discussed immigration and border security issues. But while the talk in Vienna passed largely under the radar of EU watchers, there was another meeting that was followed very closely in Brussels. When the new Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki visited longtime EU Commission nemesis Viktor Orban, his Hungarian colleague, it was all about closing ranks against Brussels and openly defying the EU order. The differences are over much more than immigration policy. It's about the core of what Europe stands for. The meeting of the Polish and Hungarian prime ministers is significant. A show of solidarity, defiance may be, in the face of Brussels, as Warsaw finds itself in an escalating standoff with EU leaders. Poland's recent judicial overhaul criticized as violating European values. It's now facing an unprecedented sanctions procedure, which Budapest has condemned, vowing to block any moves. As you know, the Commission always stands for dialogue. This is exactly what we do. This is the spirit uh, that President Juncker also pursues when uh, he offered, when he invited Prime Minister Morawiecki to come, uh, excuse me for the pronunciation, to come uh, to the European Commission. And uh, this visit is confirmed for the 9th of January. Hungary's Viktor Orban's under fire over perceived authoritarian leanings, controversial higher education laws sparking protests at home, and criticism of NGO legislation and the treatment of immigrants. The EU suing Hungary and Poland for not taking in asylum seekers. Two countries representing two headaches for Brussels, heading in to 2018. Dealing with Poland and Hungary will be a challenge for the EU in 2018. But that pales in comparison to what the world is up against when dealing with Donald Trump. The US president spent the holiday season, traditionally a celebration of love and peace, attacking pretty much everybody, from Democrats to the New York Times, from the FBI to Pakistan. In foreign policy, Trump has left many world leaders fed up. The Palestinians let it be known that they don't want the U.S. as a peace mediator anymore. The Koreas, North and South, agreed to direct talks bypassing Trump. And a similar message came from Europe this week, from Ireland to be precise. Prime Minister Leo Varadkar was asked by reporters whether the government in Dublin would seek the assistance of Trump to help end the political stalemate in Northern Ireland. Varadkar's response? Trump's idea of a good deal is that there is always a winner and a loser, but that won't work in Ireland. So, while President Trump has many enormous talents and abilities, I don't think bringing about peace in Northern Ireland would be in his skill set. Fair enough. Trump's administration entered office declaring that it would avoid becoming enmeshed in Middle East wars. But now he's taking a hardline stance on Iran, signaling support for the protesters. What Trump will do if the situation in Iran gets out of hand is anybody's guess. For now, the situation there remains tense. Take a look. Iran's anti-government protests are being watched beyond its borders. The EU is urging all involved to avoid violence and for freedom of expression to be guaranteed. This as the U.S. presses for emergency sessions at the U.N. in New York and Geneva. 
Among the 21 people killed by police since the start of the protests, he says, most of them are the sons of workers or unemployed. They're just asking for bread, freedom and a roof over their heads. The protests, which appeared to be spontaneous and without an overall leader, kicked off a week ago. It's difficult to know their exact spread and depth. The similarity between these protests and those of the Iranian revolutions in 1979, after 39 years, is the scale of the protests, which have been seen all over the country. EU foreign policy chief Federica Mogherini, seen here on a visit to Tehran, has said human rights have always been a core issue in the EU's relationship with Iran, adding that Brussels will continue to monitor the unfolding events. As a member of the Belgian and European Green Party, I say the independence of Iran is very important for me. And it is they, the Iranian people, who have decided to make their own progress without any intervention from Europe or from other countries. The European political parties have helped us morally, but we don't expect any physical intervention. And here's our look at what's ahead in week two. On Tuesday, as you heard in our report, EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker hosts Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. A kind of a crisis response meeting. On Thursday, an official ceremony marks the opening of the Bulgarian EU presidency. The entire EU Commission will travel to Sofia for the occasion. And on Friday and Saturday, 8.4 million Czechs will be called to vote in the first round of the presidential election. It will be a closely watched barometer of whether populists are gaining ground in Europe. That's it for today. I'm Stefan Grobe and you can follow me on Twitter. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your week.